Georgios Kallis is an ecological economist and a political ecologist working on environmental justice and limits to growth issues. He is a professor at the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies in Barcelona, Spain. In this conversation, Georgios and I discuss the science and philosophy behind the degrowth movement and some of the challenges behind implementing such an enormous task within nations and globally. As viewers of this show know, I don't believe mankind is going to plan for degrowth, but that post-growth reality is coming to a nation near you very soon. So in my opinion, the larger purpose of degrowth scholarship is to act as like an Overton window to get more people thinking about planning and maybe reconsidering their trajectories into what will eventually become a post-growth world. I am pleased to introduce Professor Georgios Kallis. Let's get to it. Kalimera, Georgios. <laughs> Kalimera. Hi, man. How are you? Good, and yeah. I um, only know a few works in Greek, and most of them are swear words. You are Greek <laughs> living in Spain and doing this podcast in English. Yeah. How many languages do you speak? Three, actually. <laughs> These very three Greek, Spanish, These three. and. Three. Yeah. And you know, English. in. in in preparing for this, um, we're going to talk about degrowth uh, and your recent book and your recent papers uh, and your work. Uh, but related to degrowth, I had a, a thought that the United States has the richest geological province in history, and we have the world's you know largest economy. We have the seniorage from the U.S. dollar. Uh, but there's also this lingua franca that it's a novelty that I took French and Spanish in college, you know, but people in Europe, they speak multiple languages all the time. What, what's that like having to do your work and your papers in English, which is not your native language? I mean, it's like an extra burden when you're growing up and, and working or how, how do you all manage that? Yeah, when you grow up, it is a problem. It, it's also a class thing. If you're from a high class in your country, that somehow English will arrive naturally to you. The, the lower you go down in the ladder, the more of an uphill struggle it is. I was in the middle, so let's say it wasn't easy, but it, it, it wasn't also very difficult, as difficult as it is for other people I encounter here. So for me, I did private classes. I wasn't very good until I studied abroad. Then I started practicing. But I don't th think it was until after my PhD that I went to the US and I met also my wife and we I, I kept talking more and more English that my English improved, you know. And it so it took it took years for them to improve. And are you teaching your children all three languages? Yes. So I speak to them uh, strictly Greek. Uh, my wife uh, she's Mexican, but she grew up in the US, so she speaks to them English. And then uh, our caretaker that helps us speak Spanish. And then in school, they're going to learn Catalan. So they're going to beat me by one language. <laughs> <laughs> I love languages. If, if we weren't facing a, uh, a post-growth world, I think I would have been a linguist. I, I, I studied Chinese and then had some French and Spanish. But I just think the evolution of human language is fascinating. So um, so let's get into it, Georgios. Um, many previous guests on this platform uh, have covered this topic, um, but could you articulate your flavor, your assessment of the linkages between energy, materials, technology, and growth? What What's your overall uh, worldview on that? For me, it's it's quite straightforward, and it's the basis of ecological economics that we understand the, the economy as a process of converting uh, resources into useful goods and uh, into waste. Um, so, in that sense, the more the economy grows, the more resources, in one way or the other, uh, it's gonna need. 
technology is mediating this relationship, but there is up to a certain extent that it can mediate it. At the end of the day, a compound growth, which is 3% per year, which means an economy 19 times bigger within a century, will use more and more resources. So we see a direct link between the growth of the economy and the need for fresh and more resources. So you, you're not a, uh, a devotee of the decoupling camp? No, I don't, be, I don't believe. I mean, I do believe that certain resources or certain pollutions, certain forms of waste can be reduced while the economy grows. Uh, but the more fundamental these goods are for, or these resources are for the economy, the harder is this decoupling. Now, fossil fuels is a, is a border case. I mean, it's super fundamental. The whole industrial revolution happened because of uh, fossil fuels. Fortunately, there are renewables or other forms of energy, but the economy is quite coupled with fossil fuels. I think there can be some form of decoupling, uh, absolute decoupling also, but I don't know if it can happen fast enough in order to, to avoid catastrophic climate change. Now, if we talk about energy or resources in general, uh, I don't think that absolute decoupling is possible. So the more the economy grows in one way or the other, it's going to use more energy and more resources. Uh, using better forms of energy or better forms of resources is possible, but again, up to a limit, because if the economy is 19 times bigger within a century, and then I don't know how many times, hundreds uh, within two centuries, even a benign, relatively benign form of energy starts having a cumulative impact. I agree. Uh, later in this conversation, I'm going to talk about something that you and I both agree on, even though we haven't spoken about it, which is we can and hopefully will decouple our well-being and our um, experience of life from energy and material use. Uh, and I know in your new book, you've written about that. Um, but first, let me, let me continue to uh, set the table here. Um, you are known, uh, in the degrowth movement and the degrowth movement is diverse. Can you give me your own interpretation or your own definition of what degrowth means when you say it, uh, what, what does it mean and how might it come about? We can think of the substanti substantive definition, which is, uh, on the one hand, it points to a process and on the other hand, it points to a critique. So the process it's po pointing to is an egalitarian, a just social and political transformation that its end result is a radical reduction of resource use. And by resource, I mean material resources and energy. Uh, but the important is to put the, how do you say, the horses before the truck, no? So the, the horses are that you need the social and political transformation whose result is going to be this resource, uh, dramatic resource and, uh, resource and energy reduction. Apart from that, degrowth also is pointing to something else. It's like the word decolonization, which is de, it's against the idea or the ideology of growth. So it's also uh, a set of ideas that are coming together and to launch uh, a very strong critique against uh, the social and material effects of growth. But more than that, to the very ideology of economic growth that we argue is something like what religion would to be for religious society. So it's like a kind of taboo totem that cannot be questioned, that everyone has to agree that it's good and it's not to be challenged. So degrowth is both this uh, challenge of the ideology of growth and it's also pointing to a particular process of social transformation towards much less uh, resource use so speaking about the religion part uh degrowth is a word that post-growth market technology focused people really dislike why do you think that is yeah Post-growth, with post-growth, we are doing well. I mean, I just get, got a big project with the word post-growth in it. So we are using it. Yeah, I saw that. Congratulations. <laughs> we are using it every now and then when we want to be a little bit less confrontational. Uh, what by, are, by the way, I, yeah. I, I'll chime in and say, from my perspective, I see it as degrowth is what we should do and post-growth is what we're going to have to do. That's a good way of, of, of thinking of thinking ab about it. I mean, that one way or the other, we'll have to manage uh, without growth. Uh, 
and degrowth is 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 also in in a way it's it's a harder challenge. But speaking about why why would techno technophiles or green growth people would not like degrowth? Uh, because in the, in the general uh, imaginary in the general common sense i would say of all of us no economic growth we tend to think of this process that happened after the second world war mostly bridges highways uh, spacecrafts airplanes you know so it, it would have associated that as being a economic growth that came up with an explosion of uh, new technologies and new ways of doing things so in their view to criticize that and go against that it sounds like uh, backpedaling no like retrogressing saying no to all this and saying like we're gonna live some simple ways that they were before industrial revolution and that this is wrong well of course that's not what we are arguing but i can explain their reaction to that in the sense that they feel that uh, we are challenging all that and that a different form of all that being like renewable energies, geoengineering or other forms of technologies that could emerge now that they would they believe would be the salvation and that we are turning our backs to that for something that it's untenable politically and socially. That's what I see as the criticism. So um, when most people hear the word degrowth, there's kind of a connotation that is um, that happens what do you think the average person gets wrong um when they hear the word degrowth or see a degrowth article or something like that yeah i mean it depends on what article they see and how the author of this article frames it i mean if they just hear the word again it depends always on context words never work on their own outside of a particular context it's always a person saying something so it's one thing if i say degrowth and they hear it and another one if a journalist says it dismissively on the tv or another if i don't know someone from um, an inst a think tank or a professor who wants to completely deride what we're saying says it no so the context of how it will be presented makes makes a big difference but let's say a negative reaction to it can come from what I said, that to the extent that we associate growth with a good period in the global north, in the Europe and North America, after the Second World War, where growth has generally been perceived as elevating people from low incomes to, to, a, to a middle class. And if this was growth and you want to reverse that, you want to go back, um, then you want to do something bad, no? So it might sound as something negative. Or if you understand degrowth as the period where GDP declines, uh, or when the economy has recessions and depressions, again, within a growth economy, growth-based economy, periods of no growth are very problematic. They are very unstable. So for all of us, there is the association of where well, the economy is not doing well, we don't want to be there, no? That these are not nice years. So if that's what you mean by degrowth, the reaction is, I'm not, I don't want that. No, I'm not. I'm not part of it. I think both both reactions are misplaced. And I, when I am the one explaining, I can explain in the sense that first of all, the glorious period of the 30 years after the Second World War has come to an end. 30 years after the Second World War, more or less, with the 1970s crisis, and we are 50 years after. And for these 50 years, growth has not been a marvel or a miracle, you know. On the contrary, we've seen increasing inequalities and no improvement in the quality of life. So if growth was good for a particular period of time, which could be, or it could be other things that coincided with growth, but it no longer is. And about recession, again, I would respond that, yes, of course, we're not calling for recession. We are calling for a different way of organizing the economy around human needs and obviously a model that would have to be stable in one way or the other. No one wants instability, unemployment, uh, poverty in the name of the growth. No, no one would advocate that. So how do you or we as a society implement uh, degrowth in praxis, especially in a geopolitical context, possible loss of hegemony for the United States and maybe wars? And also there's a financial aspect. The moment degrowth is implemented or happens, there's financial market crashes and 
leaving uh, less stability for society. So in the degrowth movement, is, are there two questions really, which is what would a landing spot look like at, uh, using degrowth uh, research? That's question one. And question two, how do we get from here to there given the financial overshoot and the complexity in our current world? Do degrowth scholars separate those two questions or is it all kind of a one? No, we start separating and you are asking actually the best questions uh, right now, you know, like we st we've finished the best people on, the, on, on, on this field. We've finished writing a literature review article on the 50 years from the publication of Limits to Growth. Um, and two of the most important questions that we think are underexplored that we identify there are the ones that you very nicely highlighted. One concerns the geopolitics and what room, if any, there is for this type of futures that we advocate within um, re-emergence of spheres of influence, of a sort of Cold War and geopolitical competition that has always been there, but I think now it's it's more evident. There's very little thinking on that, but I know that there are international relations scholars that they now start grapple with these questions. And the other concerns financial stability and includes financial stability again in a geoeconomic context of if any country was to face prolonged stagnation or go in the direction of the growth, there is always the, especially if it goes, let's say, intentionally in the direction of the growth, uh, there is the real fear of uh, capital exodus, of uh, punishment by international economic institutions, bringing back in line uh, and all these things that can make a process that could be in principle or in theory smooth or stable, can make it unstable within a matter of days. Uh, so the, the, these are like hard questions. I don't have answers to them and I would be hypocritical if I said I have answers to all that. But I think these are the questions we should be asking and because, you know, the opposite is, okay, this sounds like almost insurmountable, impossible, so let's try to think that we're going to do some technological miracle. I'm saying if we start from the premise that the technological miracle is not um, in the cards, you know, like how do we start dealing with this type of questions? Uh, one potential first answer to, to, to what you're saying is that the, the system is already unstable and it's not because of degrowth. So geopolitical competition, uh, possibilities of wars, war, worse wars than we've seen for, for a while, etc., are re-emerging and that's again within the contours of the current system. Also, the financial system is in many ways has been uh, unstable and many people keep telling us that it's a piling pyramid waiting to collapse. So again, um, there's it's the question of how collapse. unstable... It hasn't collapsed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's true. And many people might have said the last 50 years that it's waiting to collapse and it doesn't collapse. But I mean, the, the amount of debt, public and private right now, is on a record level in comparison to what we are producing. So... There is a question up to when we will be able to produce so much debt without. Because all that debt is a claim on energy yeah. one day. Yeah, it's a claim on energy. It's a claim also on human uh, labor. It is a claim on future generations. So I don't know that you've read my papers and work, uh, Georgios, but how I see it is we won't voluntarily contract and we will continue to kick cans financially rules everything um to keep the financial system growing because of the necessity to pay back prior debt and the interest isn't created when money is created but eventually we will run out of ways to do that and then we will contract involuntarily so the reason that I'm not directly in the degrowth movement is because I am trying to prepare society, individuals, um, nations globally for this smaller economy. I call it the great simplification. But the reason I'm a fan of the degrowth movement is because you are expanding the Overton window of the ways that we might choose to live differently using less energy, less materials, more social interactions and things like that. So to me, the degrowth 
degrowth isn't going to happen the way that it's prescribed, but it's a good advertisement for researching and people thinking about living possibly substantially differently. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I mean, I don't think that it's going to happen smoothly and uh, intentionally and voluntarily and somehow avert climate change. I think it's going to happen through conditions, if it were to happen, no? it's going to happen through conditions of partial collapse uh, and partial forced simplification. Uh, but I think it's important always in, in, in the face of historical changes to, to know what, what is it that you're proposing and what you're envisioning so that it becomes part of the reality that it's unfolding. Because if you don't have this counter narrative, so yes, my narrative is positioned within an understanding that the scenario you, you are describing is quite uh, likely. So, so let's get into that. You recently are a co-author of a paper in Nature, congratulations on that, called Energy Requirements and Carbon Emissions for a Low-Carbon Energy Transition. Can you give our, our viewers and listeners uh, an overview of the purpose of that paper and the general conclusions of that paper? Yeah, that, I mean, that paper was written by a PhD student of mine, Alyosha Slamarsak, who developed a, like a hunch, an idea that I had that no one has calculated how many emissions and how much energy we're going to use in order to make a transition to a low carbon system. Because building uh, windmills, continuing to get oil in order to build solar panels, etc., is going to burn carbon as long as we still use oil, gas, etc. So no one had calculated that and no one had seen how much energy we're going to use in this process and how much energy will be left for other uh, societal, uh, societal uses uh, along this way. So we thought about calculating it. We followed one approach. I mean, there are many different approaches one could get to that, but we took the scenarios that the IPCC has produced, which are quite uh, unrealistic, let's say, by now scenarios of how we can stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, by 2050. So we looked at, okay, what sort of energy trajectories to, do they foresee these scenarios? And then based on that and based on some calculations called energy return on energy investment, where it's calculation of how much energy you need in order to produce a unit of energy by fossil fuels, by gas, by windmills, by solar panels. Uh, Alyosha did very complicated calculations that I can't, <laughs> I don't know what he did, but he did it well. The reviewers say he also he did it well. Uh, so he did an amazing job there. Uh, we calculated that. What are the core findings? I mean, there, there is a good side and the bad side. So I was, at the beginning, I was very, I was more in a catastrophist mode than I was saying, just trying to do the transition, we're going to burn all our remaining carbon budget and we're going to overshoot limits and so it's not that bad you know so and it's definitely much better to burn this carbon to decarbonize and then not burn carbon ever again to put it simply than to prolong this thing and go slowly and keep burning carbon for everything you need to do so in one sense it's it's not catastrophic these numbers but they are quite high you know so we see that a substantial proportion of what we can emit and what energy we're going to use in the next de decades is going to go purely for the energy system, uh, leaving less for the rest of society. This is in a best case scenario that we really do something about climate change. No, that it's not, <laughs> it's not at all the case right now. But we are saying, okay, even in this best case scenario, what would that mean? And it would, it would mean, I think, that's what our research is showing uh, that we would have to use less energy uh, for other things, um, which is manageable, is doable, but I don't think it is, um, there is awareness around it in the dominant green growth narrative, which is, you know, we can use more energy, do more things, and at the same time, uh, do this uh, energy transition, clean energy transition. I have a lot of questions. Uh, I, I read your paper and I think it was a real novel approach. Um, but you're basically saying is that if we are going to optimize for climate and somehow culturally we think that's important, which I'm skeptical that we'll do that. But under that scenario, we have to massively increase 
the energy used to move to a different energy system. And that move itself will require a lot of hydrocarbons. So my first question is, you're actually asking the second of two questions, which is what would be the biophysical map if something would happen? But the, the first is the governance and market related question. And I know that's not your expertise, but I'm just curious because right now we are growing renewables quite rapidly globally, but we're still growing fossil fuels. So from a climate change standpoint, we're just extending the use of the fossil fuels because then we need a little bit less natural gas because we have more solar and wind, but the total emissions are high. But how could we stop Disneyland and Las Vegas and uh, Ryanair and all the other aspects of society that are using energy in order to invest that into a lower carbon energy uh, system? Like what would be the mechanism that would allow us, I think in your paper, you talked about 15 to 20% or something like that of current energy needs to be directed towards this plan? What, is there any suggested pathway that that could happen politically and, and economically? It wasn't part of this research, but it's part of the big research project we start now. The, the one we called post-growth deal, and it's going to be for six years. So there we're asking precisely the question you said. So one, we want to think of policies of uh, doing something, let's say, that uh, happened during the lockdowns, but doing it in a in an organized way, definitely in a more participatory way and a more accepted way, which is to prioritize essential from non-essential uh, activities and use the power of uh, regulation, of policy, etc., to to restructure the economy towards the activities that we consider essential rather than the ones that they are unessential in a context of climate change and energy transition. Now, yeah, that's the idea and that's the scientific part. Now, the political question is very difficult. Like, how how would you imagine closing down Ryanair or Disneyland? That's, that's, that's not in the, say, cards right now. It's not going to be anytime soon, but I think... Uh, it is important to think of the processes and the mechanisms through which a reallocation of energy to the important factors are going to be. But I don't know if you have thoughts on, on that, on these hard well, political I, questions. I'll say this. I have a lot of questions for you, Georgios. They're going to sound like they're critiques or hard uh, questions, but they're under an umbrella of deep respect and thanks for your work. Because I use, as you just said, <laughs> we need to understand this and ask these questions, kind of like passing the baton to more people to get them involved, because this is what we face. I don't see an easy way out of this. So you have to be doing the research and asking the questions. Um, I think we'll keep kicking cans and then respond. And hopefully there's models and pilots of living differently, using energy differently, which brings me to my next question. Does this have to be a global thing or could Spain or Greece or New Zealand do their own kind of degrowth move towards um, uh, more renewables, less fossil fuels in tandem with a smaller economy? I want to think that each country can do something to the extent also that, as you said, in a post-growth context, uh, they might be forced to adapt to that. I mean, you have Japan 30 years without growth. This becomes the new normal. So one way or the other, countries have to find, accommodate the fact that they might be not be able for their economies to grow and at the same time accommodate the fact that they have to do something about climate change unless uh, the whole world comes to ruin, which is a very possible scenario, as you were saying. But this combination, I think, forces even individual countries to think differently. Now, for something more organized and more like the development of a different economic model or a different social organization model of reorganizing activities, etc., I think it's to go like really outside of the of the main path right now. I think you need like a regional clubs or um, associations. So I think the EU 
could potentially do something like that, as the US could do something like that as a big country, or US with Canada. Uh, Greece alone, I doubt it. I mean, Greece alone tried not to pay its debts and <laughs> was brought in line quite quickly. So I don't think a small country can do it alone. Just as an aside, um, last night I discovered the analytics for this channel. And of the 15 most popular cities of with people watching this podcast, seven of the top 15 are in New Zealand or Australia. And from a population standpoint, that makes no sense. Um, but I think it's because they are at the end of the supply chain and they recognize um, emotionally the things discussed on this podcast with respect to climate change, degrowth, energy, scarcity. And so I, I think I don't think the United States is going to take the lead on anything degrowth ever. But I do think smaller countries could act as models. Um, I gave a presentation to government of Sweden last week and a couple months ago, government of Finland. And I think the Ukraine Russia situation has all of a sudden put energy and the future into prominently into many minds, especially in Europe. Have you noticed since the uh, um, Russia incursion into Ukraine um, more interest and, and intensity and urgency in, in your field or other people outside of the field suddenly paying attention to it? Yeah, I've seen, but I wouldn't put it to to the Russian invasion. I mean, I, I think it it starts with the pandemic and the lockdowns and also in a context of complete stall in relation to to progress with climate change so i think it's it's many things coming together i, I think i think the pandemic psychologically had an important effect in the sense that we saw like okay that the biophysical world can can hit us you know it's not it's not just scientists saying like out of their minds that i mean i was someone who never cared about pandemics right i was saying this is one one problem too many to worry about, you know, and so in that sense, I was a denier in something that, um, you know, that that hit us. People were saying it's very likely, it's becoming more and more likely. I was like, well, yeah, okay, it did happen. Uh, we live, we saw, we saw our fragility, fragility, and we realized more and more how fragile we're gonna be to climate change, which is an even bigger think and how little we are doing so i think i think there is recognition even by those who deny or want to delay that there is a recognition that something is not going well now then on top of that you have uh, the russian invasion then you have prices going up the roofs you have like a resurface of uh, nuclear uh, threats and potential nuclear war so the whole thing is like coming to an explosive mix and in that sense i think people right now are a little bit lost of certainties and this has opened up space for ideas that they were considered too heterodox to be given space five years ago. In, in the same way that Australia and New Zealand uh, are, pay, or at least the people following this podcast, um, paying attention to energy, um, economic decline sort of scenarios, do people in Spain get the immediate um, it's called an availability cascade, the, the salience of climate change because it's so hot there. Are people, and plus when you had the, the limits this summer of where you could only have the air conditioning to a certain level, does the general person in, in Spain absolutely believe in climate change and is worried about it and wants to do something about it? I would say believes. I wouldn't say is wants to do something about it, and I don't know where would it rank in terms of priority of problems. But I say like the common sense now is that it change, the climate is changing, and that's among everyone, independent of political beliefs, at least in Greece and Spain that I talk. I, it's, it's very hard to deny it anymore, you know, like the summers are much hotter than you have some freak events then you know like here it's december and the first cold days were like two three days ago so people see that the climate is changing it's still not a devastating change it's still something that seems manageable if it were to stop here but people understand more or less understand what we are saying that this is not going to stop here you know it's we haven't stopped emitting carbon so this is going to get worse and worse uh, 
so I think there is a there, there is an understanding of that that it's quite assimilated, but I don't think there is an awareness or an acceptance that something radical has to be done. And I don't know, that's my hypothesis. But my hypothesis is that most people are aware of that tension, you know? So if I, if I want to use a metaphor, it's like, you know, when you know you, you're still sleeping and you know that you have to wake up seven o'clock and do something terrible that you don't want to do, but you know it's coming, you know, but you're still sleeping a little bit and you wish you could sleep forever, but you know that at seven you have this terrible wake yeah. up you know it's it's this feeling and then you do, you don't feel well about it you know but you don't want to think about it also well it's right now it's metaphorically 6 30 a.m georgios and yeah. we want to hit the snooze for 10 more minutes but seven <laughs> o'clock it's coming soon um i'll, I'll point out I, I can't move my camera at the moment but it's it's negative 20 uh celsius here and people might say, oh, see, what climate change? But that, too, is probably caused by climate change with the polar vortex letting the Arctic air come, come down here. Um, so, so getting back to your, your nature paper, um, <clears throat> that paper outlined three uh, EROI, energy return on investment scenarios, high, medium, and low. Uh, some would argue that even the low EROI scenario is optimistic, first of all, because it starts with an average of already calculated current EROI figures for renewable energy. The higher end figures in that batch are disputed by some as unrealistically high, so that would skew the average of the low EROI scenario into optimistic ter territory. Then the low EROI scenario projects um, or projects a rising energy return for all renewable technologies. But but would a rising EROI for renewables actually happen under conditions of global declining resource quality and declining fossil fuel EROI? Considering, as you said earlier, that fossil fuels will be supplying energy for the construction of renewables throughout most of the transition. So my question is, why didn't you include a truly pessimistic or some would say realistic EROI scenarios more in line with um, your colleagues uh, uh, 200 kilometers to your west, um, Capellan Perez at Valladolid Vall yeah. uh, University. I can never pronounce that name. Yeah. Any comments on that? I mean, the technical... Uh, I, uh... The technical details of that, Alyosha could could better say it because he's the one who who really studied the euro numbers. He knows the literature and he thinks our scenarios are reasonable. But I mean, behind every paper there is also a story, and the story of that was that one of the reviewers was like <laughs> was very strong that our low euro scenario is not. We had one low. With basically low was like taking the lowest estimates. Uh, of the estimates of Euro right now as the basis for the low Euro scenario. But then one reviewer was insisting on the point that even the low right now have been proven wrong and it's better to take the median. And we had a long debate about that, you know, and and at some points when it, you... It's, it, it's almost a religion, right? There, there are pro-renewable fanatics and there are anti-renewable fanatics. And I believe the truth is in the middle. Renewables have arrived. They're robust. They're scalable. They are incredibly uh, EROI positive relative to energy sources that humans have used in the past. But they're not going to power this civilization. So yeah, but, but I, I know, show. I believe you, there's a huge politics behind the paper. No, there was a politics. and No, I mean, one of the reviewers, I don't think he was a renewable energy evangelist, but just thought that the low ERA values are unrealistically low. So insisted on the point that we should have the median ones for our low scenario. And at the end, you know, you it's not a politics, but it's like, okay, do I want to risk the whole paper not being published? And... Or am I fine to do with a median? And we were fine to the extent that also when we were including the low EROI uh, values, it wasn't that the result was very different, you know? So the scenario was not changing. So it wasn't a dramatic change given the low EROI values we had. So it's not that we diluted our findings or our methods for that. So it's always a give and take in this process of publishing. You know, there is this nice cartoon which says, my paper 
before and my paper after it's a car <laughs> and then the paper <laughs> after is like a car with the exhaustion up in the window etc you know right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately it's a little bit of that but yeah believe me i know my super organism <laughs> paper had much the same feedback so here's how i see it tell me what you think of this so all of these prognoses and forecasts and technological um predictions happened during a time when our energy was growing every single year we use a hundred billion barrels of uh carbon uh every year coal oil and natural gas and that roughly works out to around 500 billion human laborers added to the economy so now we can use some of those laborers and invest them to make new low carbon laborers in the form of solar wind geothermal etc but very soon for the first time in the last century plus, that 500 billion of laborers is going to be declining. So as it declines, um, then we have the financial overshoot question, but setting that aside for the moment, how can, as that declines, the EROI of those other things go up enough to, to offset it and then another thing we haven't talked about is complexity and the six continent supply chain of how everything is fit together. And I know you're just trying to set the table for these questions, but I am curious about as the total amount of coal, oil, natural gas declines pretty much year over year at some point in the future, how renewables can fit that gap, even if they are, let's say 10 to one uh, wide boundary EROI, something like that, which arguably on the surface is higher than some fossil fuels, but then there's the energy quality differential as well. So do you have any thoughts on all that? No, I mean, there is a huge transformation. I mean, what you said at the end is really important that also the energy productivity or the EROI of fossil fuels right now, it's probably lower than we thought and it's close to renewable energy. So in that sense, it's not a fundamental uh, it's not as fundamental the problem as we thought before when we thought that, okay, the, the ROI of fossil fuels is much higher than renewables. So if it's close, the transition is probably easier on that side. But then there are all the problems that have to do with the quality, the reliability, the, in the, the intermittence of the renewable energies, all these problems that people are talking about. And the overall problem, which is that we have to use generally less energy for other environmental um, reasons and uh, and also for making this transition possible. So there I follow the type of work that my colleague Julia Steinberger is doing and with, with whom we're going to collaborate, which is trying to think how can we secure 9 billion dignified lives with a fraction of the energy that we use right now. Is it physically possible, biophysically? And I think her research demonstrates models that it is biophysically possible. But then once you get into the political questions, how do we get from here to there? It, it starts getting tricky because probably there's no space for... Can you, can you link your project with Julia on the post-growth with some... Like do your work, but link it and form alliance with some political uh, sort of um, scholars on on governance questions and how this might unfold. Or is that too complex? No, I would like to, and I'm uh, and I'm open to to suggestions with whom to to link it. I mean, I'm responsible for the package on politics. I'm not a political scientist. I call myself a political ecologist, so I'm interested on how power relations govern access to resources and resource distribution. Uh, but yes, it's a huge challenge and it's more like I'm jumping into water without knowing what I'll find because I don't think there are many people thinking about this governance and political questions. I know that they are the most important questions, so... It's an important, exciting, but also frightening research on how we're going to grapple with these questions without saying something either trivial or completely utopian, you know, because we have to say something that it's also actionable. Yeah, I, I love that philosophy, I have to say. I agree with you. Uh, this is really, really hard. I'm going to ask one more hard question about this paper, and then I'm going to move on to your new book, uh, which is kind of the meat of this conversation, I hope. Um, I doubt you read my PhD thesis uh, 15 years ago, but I wrote a paper that was an ambio about 
um, multi-criteria multi -criteria analysis on the EROI that when you just focus on energy, sometimes you neglect other uh, important natural resource inputs like water or materials or copper or things like that. So in the uh, various EROI scenarios, um, did you look at the potential, if energy, if we have enough energy from renewables, does something else potentially become limiting like copper or lithium or cobalt or nickel and at the levels required uh, to feed 9 billion souls in some sort of a reduction of our material energy footprint, do s some other elements become limiting? Is that a question you've thought about? No, it's a great question. It's not something we looked in this paper. So in this paper, we just stayed on energy and emissions. But uh, the group you mentioned from Valladolid with a different model that it's also designed to ask these questions, uh, I think they're addressing precisely these questions. What what material requirements are going to be in these energy scenarios? And also the, the geography of these materials. Where are they going to come from? Um, because one, one question is the scarcity, whether there's going to be enough of these materials. Another that it's very close to home here because a big group with which we are in the same institute and with which I'm collaborating under John Martinez Allier is looking at all the conflicts and the violence that it's taking place in these so-called commodity frontiers from the places that we don't see and where all these resources are coming from. So I'm, I think it's a, it's a super crucial question and it's one that should be uh, on the front of any program for just energy transition, but just that has to think also of the implications of where these resources are going to come from. Yeah, I mean, this gets back to the the morality of all this, is if all of a sudden uh, the global north decides we must continue to grow for the next 30 years, and that growth is going to have to come from uh, as we decarbonize, we're going to have to rematerialize, as Olivia Lazard says. And a lot of that rematerialization is going to be from countries that are in the global south, have climate impacts, have civil strife. And what are the ethics of that? And that I hardly anyone is talking about that. Yeah, what are the ethics and what are also the geopolitics and geoeconomics of that? Because it seems that... They might also not be willing to sell as cheap as as we want them up here, you know. And then what's happening? So that's that's also for me what's frightening because if you read the whole discourses about the new realignment now and Europe and the North America versus China and Russia, etc., you see that on the back of the mind is a unfolding war over access to resources. Um, so, it, I mean, it might come the other way up to the north. It's like the global south is not just anymore in the subservient position it used to be, and it might demand its use for releasing these resources. Yeah, so many questions. Um, okay, you recently wrote a book called Limits, Why Malthus Was Wrong and Why Environmentalists Should Care. What, what were the core messages uh, from this uh, recent book, Georgios? Yeah, that's uh, we, we're turning page because, you know, in this book... Up well, to there's now, a lot to cover in a short yeah, conversation, yeah, 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 I no, know. No, I, yeah. I like that, I like that. It makes me reflect on my <laughs> fragmented and not call it the worst name, uh, personality and intellectual... Uh, <laughs> Interest because I'm I'm very much like into ecological economics, biophysical economics, like working with Ayosa calculating, you know, this and that euro of that energy source. But then this book was quite a philosophical exploration, you know. So some people sometimes are surprised that I'm the same person, you know. And then I have like even discussions with people that they are very studious scholars of Malthus and then they ask me all these questions. Did Malthus really say that? Why do you think that Malthus say that, you know? So it's it's very different worlds from calculating energies to arguing whether Malthus said this or that. Uh, what are the core messages of the book? Uh, let me put it in a direct way, you know? So I don't like, I don't like Malthus, I don't like what he wrote. Uh, 
I thought well, they were very problematic in ideas uh, that he wrote. And I think these ideas have been carried to our days partly by the environmental movement that I see my part of, my, myself as part of. Uh, but I never associated with these ideas. So I was always surprised when people would, would tell me, you're a Malthusian because you're in favor of the growth. You know, I was like, I'm definitely not a Malthusian. You know, I've read Malthus and there's nothing more distant from me than a... a English aristocrat who was against the French Revolution and wanted the poor people to rot in their poverty, you know. Um, so that, that's the initial reaction. But then you might say, I'm not a Malthusian, and people will tell you still, no, you are a Malthusian. You don't know it. So I was like, okay, if <laughs> if I'm not, not because it's personal, no, because if the ideas that we are talking here are not Malthusians, why are they not Malthusians? So I went a little bit more in depth to study what Malthus has said, how his ideas have traveled over time, to make an argument that within environmentalism, uh, there is another strong notion in defense of limits, uh, that it's not like, oh, we are running out of things and we should do something about it, but it's an idea that we are destroying the planet, we are destroying our own liberties, we are destroying our own quality of life, and we should organize in order to put a limit to ourselves, to limit uh, uh, our activity, to limit and channel our desires to paths that they are more constructive than destructive. And I tried to separate two different ways of understanding limits and reclaim and defend this, may I say it's social, but it's not social because it also has a very strong biophysical component, which is, you know, we are destroying the planet and we should stop destroying it. But that puts the emphasis back on us, you know, as agents of limiting ourselves and understanding that what you are calling a great simplification, uh, simplifying the way we're living, living with modesty, is also what the good life is about. I call that self-limitation, uh, collective self-limitation. I could call it also simplification, uh, but I wanted to play a little bit with um, with the idea of limits and limits to growth. So I'm saying about, we want to limit growth. We don't, want, we don't care if growth comes to an end and it's limited itself, you know? We want to do that. Does collective self-limitation start from self-limitation of an individual and then scale, or is it collective imposed on the self? No, I think it's co-evolutionary. Uh, this is a term I, I, I learned from my mentor, Richard Norgard at Berkeley, who had written about co-evolution. So I think in many, in many ways, these dichotomies we make in, um, in a modern science way of thinking very often are because we are caught in egg and chicken situations that they're better thought as co-evolutionary. So you need the one in order to feed on the other in order to feed the other. So to put it in this way, unless you have people who want to live a simple life, you will never have a collective structure or a state that would promote a simple life. Now, unless you have a state that opens pathways and lets people live in simple life instead of force them going in a particular way, you will never have the people who who would be able to live a simple life and wouldn't be like just the marginal radical ones, you know? So you need the two and the one is feeding on the other and egg and chicken that it's getting bigger and bigger, no? Um, but you need both. I agree with that. Um, so if our needs, reproduction and consumption can be internally limited, then nothing is scarce um, because we'll always have enough what does it look like? What might it look like to internally limit resources? What would it look like personally? I think personally, it's person of, of us can, can say, what would it look to live a simple life within the contours of the life now? And then there is the question of what would it look like to live a simple life or a limited life, self-limited life within the context of a system permitting you to, to live in a different way. So it's one thing, if I live in California and I say like, okay, I could live it myself and not have a car, but then I would probably die in my house now because I couldn't go to the hospital, I couldn't go to work, I couldn't go anywhere. Like just walking outside of your house is, you need to walk like 50 kilometers to reach the grocery store, right? So there, like this self-limitation is not possible. But of course, if you if the city is organized to have the public transport, etc., then more self-limitations become possible. So I think there is the question of each one of asking 
within the current life and within the context and infrastructure that we operate, what would it be to live a modest life and know how to put limits to what we want and do what we truly want rather than what we are pressed and forced to do? That's one question. And then the second question is like, what would it look to organize things differently to allow us to live even more modest and simple lives in a good way? And I think this is where Julia's work comes that tries to quantify and try to give a little bit of picture. Okay, what would it look a world where we consume 20% of the energy we consume now? No, what kind of houses would we have? Yeah. So here too is a chicken and the egg. We need to, each of us as individuals, move a little bit in the direction of simplification and consuming less. But in tandem, we need the culture to move and the infrastructure and and things like that. And the more that the culture and the infrastructure is aligned to a smaller material throughput future, the easier it will be for the chicken, us, to live in that in that environment. Yeah. And, and very important, there is public infrastructures, you know, so speaking of car, for example, if you have a good public transport is one thing, or if you have proximity to your workplace is one thing, then if you don't have it, then the car becomes almost a basic need, no? So a car, a car you can say a car is a basic need in one context, but in another context, it's not, and it's a huge difference in terms of energy, right. emissions, everything. Right. Um, so I uh, am fortunate to have traveled a lot in my life. And of all the European countries I've been to, Spain is my favorite. Can't say why. Um, the people, the food, just there's this vibe there. Now, Spain, to my knowledge, uses half the energy per capita as uh, the average person in the United States. Better healthcare system. If I got sick or injured when I was in Spain, I could go one of the Spanish hospitals. And I'm not um, I'm not glorifying poverty or anything like that, but Spain seems to be closer to a degrowth model than the United States for sure. Um, why do you think that is? And are there any examples in Spain of active pilots or communities that are at least going in the path that you and Julia are, are describing? I mean, Spain is the the general difference of Europe compared to the US and the way I think the big energy use. I mean, I studied as a water scholar and I was always water studies, you know, and I was always surprised why is per capita water use in the US two or three times bigger than in Europe? What can you do, you know? (laughs) And then, of course, it's a whole arrangement. A lot of flushing toilets. A lot of flushing toilets, a lot of toilets that use more water, lots of gardens, a lot of houses uh, that are big, and then you have also the garden, etc., etc. And then when it comes to energy, again, it's the same. You know, the way the cities are structured with a lot of private uh, personal commuting with cars, uh, these these are like f- fundamental different structures that explain the different uh, energy use. Now, Spain has very nice things in terms of uh, urban model that they weren't done in the pursuit of the growth or anything. It's how the system has evolved. But you probably what you're also describing as a positive social experience, you know, which is like pedestrianized centers of cities uh, with good public transport that you can access them. Um, walk around, you know, and have like a pleasant beer out in a plaza. Uh, this was not part of the growth, or it hasn't been part of the growth or post growth, but I think it is a model upon which you can build and at least a model that we can mobilize to resonate with people and say, like, I mean, look, you, you can have pretty nice things for for very little and you don't need much more much more than that. So there is a good basis here. That's what I meant. I I just, I know that you're not pursue, Spain is not pursuing degrowth, but there's, it's easier to do and say these things in a country like Spain. Degrowth, the words are kind of anathema to the United States experiment, at least for now. I mean, there are pockets of people. I'm not sure if it's interesting, if it's easier anywhere. I, I, I don't fully agree with that. I, I understand what you're saying about the US, but the US, if we say the ideology of growth, the ideology of growth, we can call it also the American dream in the sense of the American dream of the 1950s of, you know, the suburbia, the cars. The f- so this, this dream is quite prevalent everywhere, you know, so it's not 
even if in Spain, you know, it didn't take hold as it took in America itself. Uh, it's still an important part of the imaginary. Um, and it's still an uphill battle to challenge that and to challenge the idea of growth. So don't think that we have an easy task here. Well, what I can say is that we, there are real lived experiences. So there is the square now. Not everyone spent their time in the shopping mall. So there is the square and you can mobilize this experience to say, you know, there is something upon which we can build. But there is quite a lot of reaction here. There is reaction in Greece. There is reaction everywhere to this to to our type of ideas. There's one Spanish cultural uh, tradition that I wish the United States would adopt, and that is the afternoon siesta. Um, <laughs> it's a nice one. <laughs> so in your writing, Georgios, you use a French word, dépense. Uh, could you describe what it means and why it's important? Yeah, that's a very, that, okay, that's a, as, as, as wild as our ideas go. Uh, it's ideas that we've dis developed here in group with Giacomo D'Alessa, my colleague here, my co-author, another Italian scholar, uh, sociologist Onofrio Romano, uh, that recuperated this idea from a strange French philosopher, uh, George Bataille, who has written very crazy sexosomadosistic uh, <laughs> novels and philosophies, etc. So a, a very st strange and uh, controversial character, George Bataille, but a very original and unique thinker. Some people are appalled by what he wrote. Others, uh, like Onofrio Romano, from whom I took this idea, say that there are things from Bataille that they are so brilliant they can be useful even if there are many other ideas that one wouldn't share. So one core idea of of Bataille is that uh, societies make meaning and find joy, if you want, uh, by expanding their excess. So rather than thinking in terms of societies being in a constant battle against scarcity, have to think like, okay, what is it that gives us pleasure? And at the end of the day, the pleasure and where we make meaning as societies is in expanding whatever surplus we might have, surplus of energy, surplus of human labor, and if you think that, I don't know, uh, ancient Egypt was expanding the surplus to make pyramids and create a meaning as trying to reach the god with the pyramids, um, in a modern capitalist society or in the American dream, you might say, you know, you're expanding it in the shopping malls and in the... Uh, Las Vegas and Ryanair. Of, yes, Ryan, yeah. yes, the cornucopia of plastic to things around, etc. No, and, and the gas buzzles, the, the cars. Uh, but we are expanding, and it's important to understand that, that uh, let's say, diagnostically, analytically, that where societies make meaning and where they find joy, it's in their expenditure. So we are trying with this idea to say to to break a little bit the mold that a society of the growth is only a society of restriction of confinement of doing less and less you know and think like where would we expand our extra energies what sort of joy would we create by expanding the surplus less as it might be there will still be a surplus you know above our immediate basic needs where would we expand it and how and we take there the ideas of expanding it that the importance is to expand it collectively you know in collective feasts in collective knowledge humanities curiosity but it's ex it's important to keep in mind this depends this uh, unproductive and non-utilitarian expenditure that you are not expanding in order to produce more in the future or do something else but you are simply expanding and that's the moment actually that you're at your happiest if we might put it this way I love that idea for two reasons. First of all, is we have, um, you're a biophysical economist, so we have resource and energy inputs and, and resource and energy outputs that give us brain experiences. And right now, a lot of that energy input, we always look at it as what does it produce? Um, so this is, you know, you and I and people in our network are uh, in some ways peddlers of fear because we're talking about limits and that society is going to have to change because for climate and energy reasons and many other reasons, including equity and some of the things you're working on, what we're doing now cannot continue. 
And that is a fearful thing, but we actually need to lead with a carrot or something creative and hopeful and depends to me, my, my quick take on it is it's where can we imagine that we could expend our surplus in the future, even if it's a smaller surplus. And I often say that after basic needs are met, which for many humans, they're not, but after they're met, most of the best things in life are free or close to free from a biophysical perspective. So mm -hmm. is that kind of what you're getting at there? Yes, yes. And it's important these things that they are free to remain free and expand them free because this is where pleasure is coming. So this siesta you were saying, it's two hours, but you're being very unproductive, no? You could you could stay and work and check emails, etc., etc. But you're being unproductive, sleeping for two hours, doing nothing, you're basically nothing. But it's also like a huge bonus to your quality of life and your and your well-being. And it's precisely things like that uh, that we need to recover, the capacity to expand things that they are for free and expand them for free. Because within capitalism, it's the opposite. It's like everything is squeezed in order to use it, in order to produce more. So it's like, how can we squash the siesta so these two hours that they are lost, no? come back in the machine in the form of human energy and human energy is also fossil energy you know because these two hours i'm probably in my office with the lights etc in order to produce more no so we're saying no just let it be release it we are happier and we are also using less of our human energy and of our fossil energy i did want to offer my analytical take and also philosophical take uh, i have not been a malthus scholar i know that he predicted that uh, exponential growth in demand would outstrip the geometric growth in food production and that we would have a problem. Well, he was wrong in my book because he didn't know about fossil fuels, uh, number one. And then Paul Ehrlich and others, um, 170 years later, wrote a book, The Population Bomb, and Paul was wrong because he didn't know about debt uh, and globalization. And then we hit another wall in 2008 where the central banks took over the role of commercial banks in propping up the monetary creation. And then COVID, and we had this massive control of governments to stabilize the economy. We're running out of cans to kick in my philosophical observation, which is why I agree at the core of your work, is the next can to kick is in our minds, that we don't need all this energy and stuff stuff to live good, meaningful human lives. Most of it is wasted. Um, in my movie, I say we're turning billions of barrels of ancient sunlight into micro liters of dopamine. And I think serotonin and oxytocin and other of our evolved neurotransmitters are have been de-emphasized. And so to go into the depense or the siesta or, or other things, that is the, the stakes where we're at, is how can we culturally recognize where we came from what we're doing and where we can go and it's not going to be using more energy and stuff that gives us meaning that's my personal view on that do you what do you think no a hundred percent agree but i mean um i have a different interpretation of what Malthus said so but i don't think it's so important so i, I wouldn't stick with that but I'll, can, I'll tell people to read your book yeah read my book because Malthus didn't predict that and he was actually much closer to how economists think nowadays than we tend to think i mean the way you described what Malthus thought is the way elric recovered him in the 60s but i think it's interesting and that's what i saw in my book to go and read Malthus without the glasses of Elrich in the 1960s and the debates we have now, you know, and read him in his own terms. And then you see something much closer to an original economic argument about arguing in favor of growth in the, lim in the name of limits and in the name of scarcity, which, has, which helped me locate it there. And, and I think it's a, a problematic trap that we, we, we still keep falling in as environmentalists. So, so um, quickly to summarize that, you think that my take on Malthus um, is popular and simplistic and probably incorrect, that there's a deeper nuance there that most people don't understand. Yeah, there's no problem. I mean, in what you said, I agreed in everything. So the way you said it, there wasn't any problem with that. And I'm not like scholastic to say, oh, no, but you shouldn't say that Malthus said that. But there is a bigger problem to the extent that... 
there are certain environmentalists that reproduce an, a certain type of thinking that stems back to Malthus and to the way Malthus framed these ideas that can be problematic. So there it gets important to see what Malthus precisely said, which is different from the way we often tend to think is what he said. Claro. Okay. Final question before I get to my closing questions. Um, and again, uh, probably each of these questions could be an entire podcast. I noticed that you, um, that one of your ideas is to eventually somehow tax resources instead of labor. And this is something I've looked into uh, quite a bit because I think that's one of the only viable long-term pathways. Can you just briefly expand on how and why this would work and how it might come about and, and any other summary thoughts on that concept? I mean, economists on this question, they have developed quite a lot of thinking. I was in the PhD thesis of a student here from our department who was doing a new type of models around this idea and the implications and the different designs. But it's a pretty sim simple idea right now. The majority of tax revenue is coming out of taxing our work. Uh, our salaries, etc. A different way of doing like 95 it. 95%. 95%, yeah. Uh, I think we should tax also wealth a little bit more in, for equity purposes and redistribution. Uh, but apart from that, we can tax our energy use or our carbon use in order to, to raise the revenue. And in this way, uh, thinking now as, a, as an economist, no, you would incentivize activities that they are high in terms of their human energy or human value but low in terms of their uh, carbon content because you would tax the carbon content and you wouldn't tax the human labor so in that sense it's a simple uh, intuitive idea there are questions then of design so how would you do it in a way that it's also socially progressive and not regressive uh, there are different designs, um, whether you would uh, give money back uh, as tax cuts to everyone, only to those working, whether you would give a basic income or a dividend, and there you enter into models. You can, you can study all these things, but I think the basic idea is very intuitive, very strong, and very correct. Uh, <laughs> the, the the next question is why it hasn't caught up because it is it has been around for 20 or 30 years now you know and it's not also it's not also like a radical idea let's say it's an idea that even mainstream economists uh, have toyed with but still it has been difficult to to, to push it well now people are recognizing the validity of it but every year that goes on the haircut that would have to happen on a financial system gets larger um so it becomes politically harder by the year even though it cognitively becomes more relevant by the year so i hope you and your, your new project can can work on that uh, so it, do you have, uh, t 10 minutes or so more to, uh, to do some final questions? Excellent. Uh, these are more on the personal, uh, note. Um, so given your lifetime of scholarship and reflection on these issues, do you have any personal advice to the listeners of this show going into this time of global poly crisis, potential, um, post growth living, et cetera? I mean, the advice I have to give them is the one I try to tell myself too, but it's like live live the way you want the world to be, you know? Um, so try try to be consistent. Uh, in our book, we, we joke, we say like up to, in the case for the growth book, we joke, we say uh, less than four contradictions if you have in, in your life, uh, you're a hypocrite, right? More than, uh, Antonio Turiel has said that here in Spain also. More than yeah, ten, you're more a than, more, than, more than ten, you're a fanatic. Uh, no, or, less less than four, you're a fanatic. More than yeah. ten, you're a hypocrite. So in between, uh, you can yeah, have. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know say, that that came from Antonio. Pedro Prieto uses that quote all yeah, the time with me. People here in Spain use it, and I, and I think it's a good one, eh? which is within within the the limits of knowing that you're going to have some contradictions. Try to live the change you want to be, and try to come together with others that they want the same change and organize and associate i think that's the main advice i give and that's the the best or the first step that all of us can and should do not to uh <laughs> sidetrack the conversation so much but on the depends topic 
Spanish phrases are the most colorful, interesting, coolest <laughs> phrases ever. There's so many of those little things like, I am not really from Bilbao. I'm from, like, if you're from Bilbao, it's like you're a tough guy and there's some yeah. joke about shaving and like, yeah. I've heard hundreds of them. They're, they'll, they're <laughs> hilarious. We don't have that in the United States. This, this one cultural, with the contradictions, yeah. we have to find the originator because I don't know. I okay. keep saying some of these people citing one another, but I don't know who, 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 who coined it first. It's a funny one. Well, we'll I'll have Lizzie, uh, the podcast curator, look it yeah. up. So Georgios, you are a college teacher. Teacher, um, and also a champion in the degrowth movement. So you're teaching these things to students. What specific recommendations do you have for young humans who become aware of our climate, energy, equity, biophysical constraints to the human enterprise? I would say don't depress and act, you know, live your life and and organized to act. Uh, I hear a lot about climate anxiety, climate depression. I fully understand it. Um, but I have to say that all generations, most generations living in this planet lived in in pretty difficult times. So in bad times. We, we live in quite bad times in some ways. In other ways, those of us living in the global north live also in quite good times. Uh, the future is gloomy, but the future is always open. And many terrible things have happened for humanity in the past. Uh, but people have come together and they have overcome them, walked through them, created new things. So my main advice would be don't depress and act. act you know, Do what you can and organize with others uh, to bring change. Now is not the time for depression. Do you have a good response from your classes uh, uh, at the end of the semester with your students learning all this stuff? Yes, I'm, I'm, our students are quite a self-selected sample of people coming here to learn about the growth, etc. So they are, they are there. Um, so I do get good responses. I did get a response from a student that she told me that after taking our masters, probably she didn't know that much about the growth before, so she interacted during our masters. She told me after I got the master's, I developed very high levels of anxiety and depression, you know. So this this has struck me a little bit as a, as a talent, you know. How is it? Wh why is it that, uh, yeah, our material... I can understand why, eh? because the reality is hard to stomach. And for us, because we work with it and we keep talking about it, it's like being in psychotherapy all the time, you know. You keep talking about it, so you... You neutralize it. Uh, if you first encounter it, it can be like a difficult encounter. That's a, that's exactly right. Two quick thoughts on that. One, um, not everyone is the same. So there will always be a distribution of responses for humans coming across this. My reaction to a lot of my students, they found more depressing things in my Reality 101 course but they didn't find them depressing because we process it, processed it as a group. And to know the landscape, to see how these things fit together is actually really enlightening and, and helps with your neurochemical response to these things. So I think it's the combination of having a community to discuss, like you were saying, we're working on this all the time, um, and uh, an understanding, a clarity it's it's comforting in a, in a weird sort of way. Um, so, Georgios, uh, what do you personally care about most in the world? Yeah, right now I care for my daughters. They have two twins that they are three years old, so I, I really care about them. Um, but I think also caring about them fortified my feelings of caring about the rest of the world because... It's a, it's a great gateway to empathy, you know, like feeling about how much I care for these two human beings and how much other cares equivalently for their human beings and how much we have to care for one another. So it kind of strengthened my feelings of care and empathy for others and uh, for the future, especially of the young ones. That's beautiful. Um... Of all the issues we've discussed or any other issue uh, in your mind, what are you most concerned about in the world in the coming 10 years? Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about nuclear war, to be honest, or, or, a, or a war between U.S. and China. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with the faster collapse than climate, you know, that then climate would come on top of it on, on the ruins. I, I'm, I'm concerned because I see like, um, you know, like uh, in Greek tragedy, they say, what, what's the form of a tragedy? The form of a tragedy is two actors, each one looking at their own rationality and their own logic without any limit and then pursuing it to the very end, to the common ruin, you know, to the ruin of, of both actors. Uh, of both protagonists and there are elements in the current moment that uh, you can see the superpowers pursuing particular logic to which one cannot see an easy uh, way out of it so that's what concerns me for the next 10 years yeah dude we gotta talk more often i i, I only know of your work we've never spoken before this and I, I we agree on almost everything you've said today so that's nice um i i, I agree with you on that so in contrast what uh, brings you hope uh in the next 10 years or so what what are things that you're hopeful about i think there are openings and i think p precisely because it's not a comfortable conformist uh, era of eh, things are more or less fine why should we rock the boat the boat is rocking a lot so people are moving around and trying to find uh, new meanings and new senses and I see more and more young people coming here abandoning careers in, uh, in comfortable jobs in marketing etc because they feel they have to do something uh, so I, f I feel something unexpected and uh, big, politically interesting uh, will come out in the next 10 years. I don't know what form it will take, but I'm pretty confident it will. If you were a benevolent dictator or something similar and there was no personal recourse to your decision, what is one thing, one policy, one uh, thing that you would implement to improve human and planetary futures? I would ab abolish dictators and resign myself. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm very staunch Democrat, and I'm—I mean, I'm not saying it like that. I was—I was reading about Solon, you know, who in my book about limits, I try to explain the, the logic of self-limitation, and then I go back to ancient Greece. Solon instituted democracy, you know, in in in, in ancient Athens. He said these are the rules. This is so. He was the most powerful person at that moment. And uh, and then he says, like, I'm exiling myself. So he got self-exiled. And he said, because precisely me accumulating all this power that I have right now, and I could use it benevolently to say, I'm going to stay here forever to protect democracy and to let it have its first steps. And you really need me because I'm the mastermind of the whole constitution. He said, no, if I stay here, I'm accumulating power, which is precisely what... I tried to institute here again. So he left the city. He said, exiled. I'm not waiting for you to exile me. I'm exiling myself. And I think it's a great metaphor. We need politicians like that. I keep seeing politicians that they say, I'm really important for the movement. I'm not going to step down. No, get out, you know, St step out. Even if you're very important, democracy and people need rotation. You know, they don't need the benevolent one person figure. So that kind of links your idea of depants and the chicken and the egg of collective versus individual is we have to advocate for an open society and use less resources and kind of um, expand awareness to others of that. And our society on the growth upswing is focused on monetary power, which leads to political and absolute power. Mm -hmm. And there's going to have to be some sort of different arrangement uh, if we're going to make it through this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, thank you so much for your time, uh, George Os. Is there anything else you'd like to share to those listening? No, thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. We touched on many topics and I really enjoyed uh, having someone uh, that uh, with whom my ideas align and asking, uh, let's say, the, the really important questions. To be continued, my new friend. Thank you, Nate. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 